All right, welcome again to our final lecture as part of our Mesoamerican lecture series. Very excited to have Dr. Richard D. Hansen with us this evening. He's the director of the Mirador Basin Project in Guatemala and research professor at Idaho State University. He's previously taught at the University of Idaho or the University of Utah and UCLA. He's the founder and president of the Fairs Foundation. He graduated with a double major it, with honors in Spanish and archaeology from Brigham Young University in 1978, and then a master's degree in anthropology in 1984. He was a Fulbright scholar in Guatemala from 1989 to 1990 and received his PhD from UCLA with highest honors in 1992. He was named one of 24 individuals that changed Latin America by Latin Trade magazine. He was named Who's Who in America in 2024 and received the Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Achievement Award. He received the highest possible award in Guatemala in 2017, the Order of the Quetzal, and the Orden de la Moja Blanca in 2019 from the Guatemala Ministry of Defense. In 2014, he was a Kislak lecturer at the Library of Congress. In 2012, he was the Chevalier d'Arts et de Letters in France and the Orden de Pop in Guatemala. In 2009, he was awarded the Achievement Award and Professor of the Year by Idaho State University. In 2008, he was named Environmentalist of the Year for Latin America by the Latin Trade Association. And in 2005, the National Order of Cultural Heritage by the Nation of Guatemala. He's published 228 scientific and popular papers, three books, 33 book-length technical volumes, and his programs have been crucial in conserving 810,000 acres of tropical forest in Guatemala. He's been a co-organizer of several major Maya exhibits and museums. His work has been featured in 36 film documentaries, including work for National Geographic and the Discovery Channel. He was the principal consultant for Mel Gibson's Apocalypto, and CBS's Survivor Guatemala and National Geographic's The Story of God with Morgan Freeman. His presentation tonight is entitled The Cultural and Natural Legacy in the Cradle of Maya Civilization, New Perspectives from the Mirador Kalkbul Karst Basin System. And with that, Dr. Hansen, go ahead and take it away. Well, great. Thank to be with you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Steve, for this uh, this chance to meet with this group. And uh, I love people that have an interest in Mesoamerica because it's a great and fascinating area of the world and it has a tremendous cultural heritage. I want to point out uh, some uh, some interesting things here that, uh, that uh, I hope that we can answer during the course of the presentation. If you have questions, I may answer them during the course. And that's why we will uh, we'll start from here now and just go into this this story now as you know some of these are, titles will be in spanish i apologize for that but um uh, you if you know anything in mesoamerica you know spanish but i'll be able to clear this very well in english as well 98 percent of all the sites you see in mesoamerica are either classic or post-classic classic from three to nine hundred a.d or post-classic from 900 to 1511 AD, 98%. Only 2% of those sites are pre what we call pre-classic, from about 1600 BC to about AD 150. And of course, you all, you're all familiar with the great classic cultures of the Maya, the palaces, the incredible tombs, the hieroglyphic panels, the stele, the architecture, are all classic trademarks of classic Mayan civilization. And we're all familiar with that, um, with that uh, kind of legacy that the classic Maya left us. But when we look at the earliest cities of Mesoamerica, though, we're looking at the uh, some very early sites of the Olmec heartland, which is in this area of, of the Gulf Coast. There's some very early sites along the Pacific coast of Chiapas and Guatemala, and then a nest of very large and very early sites in northern Guatemala and in southern. Peche, Mexico. These are the earliest sites that we have, and we call it the basin because it was, it's actually a, a very ancient basin system. 
uh, it was uplifted about 65 million years ago. And this photo that was published in National Geographic in November of 1992, if you go back to your National Geographic articles, you'll see this image. This was a satellite image with infrared, and it shows that the vegetation at the time the photo was taken. In the upper left there, you see the blue of Mexico, which was all deforestation. The red that you see was high tropical forest. And that patch of green that you see in the middle is a different type of vegetation. It's a swamp style vegetation. And as a result, it has a different wavelength on their infrared image. And doesn't matter what infrared image you want to look at, you see that same form, the same pattern of uh, that, uh, that uh, heart-shaped group in the middle of northern Guatemala and southern Mexico. This is an article that we published in Plus One uh, last year, uh, two years ago, actually, 2021, showing the actual geographical borders of this system. And you can see the, 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 the blue that you see there are all these uh, where the water stagnates. It doesn't leave. It's surrounded by a ridge of hills on all sides, these ridges, um, these ridge of hills are about 200 to 300 meters high, made of karstic limestone. And it makes a, a mountain range that completely surrounds this system. And no matter where you are in the basin, you look to the edges, you can see the edge of that, of that system there. Um, the uplifted hills that surround and form the edge of this, uh, of this area. Now, this is the map of what, kind of what it looks like. Uh, the two yellow lines that you see there are the range of hills that surround the system. And it's separate from the rest of Mexico and separate from the rest of Guatemala, um, uh, from the Paten. The, even the soils are chemically distinct. Now, this map was a map we made in 2011. And these were the cities that we knew existed in that area uh, by, by 2011. The gold pyramids are light to cull or larger, and the pyramids that are brown are cities that were um, smaller than to cull. And that's kind of the way we looked at it in 2011. This is the way that it looks today. The, all of these are cities concentrated in the basin. Uh, there's and, and the left over here, in the lower left, there are no sites. To the right, there are very few sites in this region here. But look at the concentration of large and early sites that are found uh, concentrated in this basin, surrounded by this range of hills. As we combine 964 of these sites into cities that we know were part of the same polity, we form 417 cities. And the major ones you see here in black on this schedule, we can even, we've even published a paper that shows that we can categorize these these are all cities that are um, with architecture larger than 20 meters high. And of course, Il Mirador is the largest one in the area. We published a paper last year uh, in Cambridge called LIDAR Analysis of the Contiguous Mirador Karst Basin. And it has, uh, we are very fortunate because this paper ranked 969 of their series which put it number one of all outputs from ancient Mesoamerica, the, the, the journal that was published in. It put it uh, number one from all uh, articles from similar age, and it put number 16,000 of 25 million scientific papers ever published on any subject, which puts it in the top 1% of any paper ever published in, in history on any subject. So we were fortunate in that it showed, and it shows the interest in three things. It shows an interest in the Maya, shows an interest in LIDAR technology, and it shows an interest in Guatemala. And this was a, a very fortunate thing. Now, these are the sites. These are some of the sites that you see with one of those little pyramids uh, that are concentrated in this basin. Uh, very large, very early and massive architectural constructions. Just that area has these follow following characteristics. Among the largest ancient cities in the entire Western Hemisphere, among the largest pyramids in volume in the world, the tallest pyramids in the Americas, the earliest Maya cities, unique concentration of early Maya cities, the first freeway or superhighway system in the world, probably one of the first political states in the Americas, one of the five founding civilizations of the world, the cradle of Maya civilization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are the characteristics just within 
the borders of that system that's that's found in northern Guatemala. It's the last area of track in tract forest in Central America or in Guatemala. Uh, there is no more. This is it. Uh, this uh, beautiful green, lush tropical forest with all the species you could expect to find there. Uh, when would you expect to find a bat the size that you see there? They're found in that basin, and uh, they're very, they're very uh, exceptional um, uh, animals. We find huge quantities of amphibians and reptiles in the basin um, that are that are concentrated in this area. Uh, we find in we've been working with the University of Cornell uh, on the bird. They're the world's best ornithology labs. Uh, dealing with birds, and we've discovered that the basin is one of the major flyways. The central flyway and the eastern flyway of the United States uses the Mirador of Kalakmul Basin as its destination as it flies to the south. And these birds are abundant in this area. You could do a whole series of bird watching tours just looking at the birds in the system. In the month of, of June, you could spend a, a, an entire tour just looking at the variations of caterpillars extraordinary range and shape and forms of caterpillars that are found in these areas that are that are unique and we have uh, we've identified species that um, uh, uh, we have found 27 new species of, of butterflies and moths alone and we don't even know what the caterpillars look like on some of these new species in the month of september you could spend uh, just looking at the different types of fungi the different varieties of mushrooms that are growing in this area, extraordinary variety and range of, of, of tropical fungi that's found uh, growing in this area makes it a, a remarkable thing for anybody that's interested in that subject. Or the, the variety of orchids. The wild orchids that are growing out in this area are exceptional. And you see some of the size of some of these things. Some are very small and some are, are very large and yet we have such an exotic smells that come from this, including uh, really, really amazing rainforest honey that can be found in um, the stingless honeybees that harvest the, the nectar from these orchids. We also have the second greatest concentration of jaguars in the world. We, for one time, we were the greatest concentration, but we found in southern, southern Bolivia has an area called Las Charcas, and that has... Um, that has a greater concentration of jaguars than we have. They have 13 jaguars per 100 square kilometers, and we have 11.28 jaguars per 11 square kilometers, which gives us a remarkable um, chance to look at these magnificent animals. These, uh, these are caught with our camera traps that we have established out there, so we know the range and extent and the variety of cats. What's amazing is that the area, and this is just the jaguars, we're not talking about the, the, the puma and the, the ocelot, the marguey, the jaguarundi, because there's a bunch of prey that they can still survive with, with that kind of feline pressure. Uh, and the tapir, of course, is one of those uh, remarkable species that are, I mean, a large tapir weighs 700 or 800 pounds, and that can feed a lot of cats. So they, they thrive there. We found to the day 27 new species of butterflies and moths. Uh, Dr. Jack Schuster of Del Valle University and Jose Monson have done the collections. We do we set up uh, traps, insect traps, at all different levels of the canopy. We've discovered there are certain species that thrive only in the upper levels of the canopy. We find species that only are found in the middle canopy and species that are only found on the ground. So as a result, we have to set traps in different areas of the canopy to recover these species. Uh, these are some of just a few of the new species there. Uh, uh, that we have uh, we have identified. This one that you see here is the Cincinnus hansoni, by golly, which was, uh, there's also a Cincinnus mel gibsoni, the name for mel gibson. We published a book on this, uh, on the insects of the of the uh, Mirador Basin. We've got another book that we're preparing on this. We're studying the floor of the basin. We've discovered uh, with uh, Dr. Cesar Castaneda six types of tropical forest. Tikal, for example, has three types of tropical forest. We have six types of tropical forest in the basin, which makes a much greater biodiversity than we ever uh, had known or thought was available possible in our area. 
And those six types of tropical forest allow us a wide range of, of observations of different species and how they interact. One of the greatest uh, treasures for us, though, as scholars, are the concentrations of ancient cities that are found in this area. These are large, they're massive, and they're preclassic, a century before the time of Christ. We have more middle preclassic ceramics from, from the basin than almost all the other sites combined in the Maya lowlands. Uh, tremendous numbers of middle preclassic dating from 1000 BC to about 400 BC in this area. These are the faces of 1000 BC um, uh, figurines that are found in these areas. And in in particular, this is from one excavation at Mirador, extraordinarily uh, unusual and and fascinating examples of the of the societies that were there. Look at this figurine, for example, the detail. And you know, when we exaggerated the color on the computer, we discovered it was painted blue originally, and but it has the red lips. You see the teeth on it. It's a beautiful example of. Uh, of how these figurines were, were made and how what they used them for, we're not quite sure. Now, in this particular example, you see a Maya figurine at the top from the basin. Uh, this dates to about 800 BC. But at the same time, in the same deposit, we found the Olmec plaque. Now, the Mexicans like to say that the Olmec are the mother culture of Mesoamerica. We'd like to modify that a little bit by saying that the Olmec are the sister culture of Mesoamerica, because we have at the same time that the Olmec are thriving in the Gulf Coast, we have the Maya doing very well in the Mirador Basin. What this shows is there was an interaction of some kind between the Olmec and the Olmec heartland and the Mirador Basin. But you notice that that figurine at the top is not Olmec in the slightest. In fact, none of the figurines that you see here are Olmec looking in any way, shape, or form. And yet we had contact with the Olmec at this early period of time. The earliest ceramics that we find from these very early contexts at about 1000 BC are these, what we call the tecomate, or the gourds, the gourds which are incised or they have restricted restricted um, uh, apertures at the, at the mouth of the vessel. They're almost always incised and they're found in, uh, in, in shaping and in shape of, uh, of pumpkins, for example, or gourds, um, there um, and and shallow bowls that we find in in these areas, and all from sealed context. This is an example of the sealed context. And this drawing or this photo here, you see that the upper level here, this uh, this is a whoops, let me back up here. This is a floor about 500 BC. This floor here, and these earlier examples down here or as early as 1000 BC down in this area here, which gives us the chance to understand the context of this. Our carbon dates uh, show that this is, uh, uh, this is um, uh, consistent. Uh, we have a, a good example of um, quite a few dates uh, from 2600 BC to 2400 BC that, was, uh, that uh, also coordinates with the pollen that we found in three lakes on the western edge of the basin. So there's an occupation there, but they're not building anything. They're planting corn though. We have corn pollen from every one of the examples that is associated with these carbon dates. And then there's a gap till about uh, 1200 BC. And for 1200 BC to, uh, to 200 BC, we have massive uh, evidence of occupation, heavy occupation in this, in this basin that uh, dates to these time periods. This is just one, one example from one excavation of the concentration there. They're eating a lot of apple snails, the pomacea shells, and they're, um, they are um, bringing these shells in from the swamps that surround the basin. And they're also importing obsidian from a, a place called San Martin Hilo Tepeque, but they're, absorbing, absorbing, they're bringing in the obsidian in raw form, in crude form. They're not bringing it in as finished polyhedral cores. They're bringing it in as raw stone and initially working that raw stone out at Mirador. They're also developing social status and rank. Uh, the uh, figurine of the tooth, the human tooth that you see on the right, has an inside, uh, an inset piece of hematite 
that we carbon dated at 800 BC. But you can see the deformed skulls here and the inlaid jade in teeth indicating rank and status at an early period of time. We also find the symbols of royalty. They from 1000 or 900 BC, we're finding these symbols of royalty, which are the woven mat motif. When Cortez came to 1519 to, to Motecosoma, the Aztec emperor, he was never allowed to touch the ground. He was walking, always walking on woven mats. And that's the symbol of royalty that we find very early in the Mirador Basin, indicating this, the systems of kingship were well established by the middle pre-classic from 1000 BC to, to 600 BC, well established by this period of time. Now, what we're doing now is we're at Harvard, we are now in the process of analyzing the DNA. We have 98 samples of DNA that we've extracted from throughout the basin. Dr. Dana Coleman, which you see in the bottom part there, is, uh, is working with this with David Reich of Harvard. This is the lab where they're processing all our material right now as we speak. And we hope to have those results shortly. In fact, we're, we've got a paper coming up in the Society for American Archaeology in Denver in, um, in April of next year, which will present all this results of all this material. They're also importing shells from the Caribbean. And, but these shells are not jewelry. They appear to be some form of currency because they still have the spines on the shell. It'd be very uncomfortable to wear those kind of shells as, uh, as decorative. We've never found them in any burial context. We always find them in ritual uh, ceremonial context though. And they're also working cotton and they're also applying stucco to, to vessels that are already slipped with a fine slip, but they're applying stucco to the slip. They're all making a mass on architecture. I would have bet the, the farm um, a few years ago that the earliest mass were about 300 BC. But now we have mass here, such as this one here, about 600 BC. And you can see the, uh, the exotic nature of these. These are, these are architectural, uh, this is architectural art in all the original colors. These, by the way, are the original colors of this art that these big snouted um, creatures, uh, semi-deity semi fortress that we find uh, on the face of buildings. In the southern part of the base, we discovered another site called El Pesquero, in which we have um, this building was covered by a late pre-classic pyramid dating to about 300 to 200 BC. But this building had this unusual art and beautifully well-preserved uh, and protected. And when we looked at the ceramics from this, uh, from this building, they were all the middle pre-classic 600 BC type ceramics. So we've never, ever seen a building in that sophistication from this time period. They're usually, if they were exposed, they're badly damaged, would never see them. And we have yet to find that kind of a building um, uh, in, intact. The Maya by 800 BC are placing monuments though. These are upward appearing deities on unmodified boulder sculptures that we find, or they're using uh, altars with downward peering heads on, on, on very early sky band elements across the top, or they're identifying early kings. This monument from Nak Bay, nearly four meters tall, has two kings standing facing each other, probably the founder and the, uh, one of the successors there. And notice he has his left hand extended with his finger pointing to the source of their royal authority, which uh, I'll point out who that is in just a minute when we get to the central Acropolis. But these are portraits of kings, all decked out in royal garb, all decked out in fantastic um, uh, symbols of royalty and symbols of sophisticated art and, and, and quite complex iconography. Um, very, very abundant. We also find evidence of writing uh, in the pre-classic. We cannot read pre-classic texts. Nobody can read pre-classic texts. We can read the classic texts. Classic texts have been deciphered by a group, large group of scholars, been working on this for, for decades to finally come up with the, uh, the translation of the classic texts. But the pre-classic texts are a different system. Uh, we, know there, we know that it's, um, it's sophisticated because of the, um, 
The glyphs have prefixes and suffixes. So we know that there must be a phonetic value to these. We just need a larger corpus of pre-classic text to be able to, to deal and understand this concept. Now, the question is, why are they there? Why in the most distant location from a river or from a lake that you could possibly get? And, um, and when you look at the bajos of this area where the swamps, where the water stagnates before it is from this, the surrounding ridge of hills that surround it, the water stagnates there and it forms um, these um, incredible, um, ba what we call bajos. Now, as we fly out, you can still see some fossil remnants of the ancient system, which we call Sivales. And these Sivales are treeless wetland marshes that you still see some remnants of those ancient systems still there. They're without trees, they're marshy, they're marshy, they're swamps, um, and uh, they're marshy, they're swamps, and they are, um, uh, they're, there's no trees uh, growing on them. And yet you see it near El Mirador, all the blue that you see there is are these swamps. So you can see the density and concentration. Up to 63% of the basin is formed of these lowland swampy marshes. And when we do the analysis of the isotopes on this material, you'll find the super, the this the subsur the surface of the area there, and you find near the surface the three C, the, the C3 isotopes identifying the natural forest that exists today. But as we dig down, we find the C4 isotopes, which show that these all of these tree cover bajos today were those grassland marshes and wetland marshes before. And that's what drew the Maya to that area in the first place. They were exploiting those marshes for extraordinary agricultural capability. And they were making a, like what we call chinampas, like we find in the highland Mexico, you still see some remnants of the Aztec system. But this system was existent by 800 BC in these areas where they were farming these wetland marshes with by dragging the soil and making canal systems, but that rich organic mud was there. And it, it, by these ancient cities were flourishing because of that agricultural capability. What the Maya were doing is they were harvesting the mud from these wetland marshes, harvesting the mud and hauling it by the thousands of tons to their agricultural terraces. So the Sivalis then became the economic engines of the entire um, early Maya civilization. That mud was why they were there. That's why they're not on Lake Patenitsa or any of the other big lakes in the area. This image shows the natural soils, the lime covered soils you see at the bottom. And then where my hand is, you see that imported mud that was brought in. Some of these cases, this, this mud is even four meters thick, which they brought in to renovate their fields. They added another little layer of mud and it gave them those in true uh, agricultural capabilities. We've analyzed the phytoliths from all this and they were raising corn, cotton, beans, uh, uh, chocolate and palms that they were raising uh, in in and squash raising on this and and all the we have all these areas analyzed with the phytoliths which are the the silicate remains of plant cells that can still be detected with microscopes and we know what they were raising where and how they did it they in, in, they built thousands of kilometers of uh, extraordinary terrace systems. This is a LIDAR image of, uh, of, of nearly a mile and a half of, of terraces. You can see the, the terraces found in this region down. All of these are stone terraces with the imported mud behind them. Here's another example of other terraces, the extraordinary terrace systems on any slope. Uh, was, they were taking advantage of the incredible productivity of that mud. In our parks, we have trees, or we have trees and grass and flowers. And their parks said every square meter was for some type of productivity: corn, squash, beans, cotton, chocolate, palms were growing in these areas, and it gave them a high productivity, and it generated the wealth they needed to build these kinds of massive and large early cities. 
Um, they had the wealth to do it. They had the extraordinary power of labor to 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 do this and to have that kind of labor building all these buildings contemporaneously and at the same time approximately uh, is a testament to the the ability of agriculture and the ability of these of these societies to take advantage of that early early system the other thing that they caught on to very early in time by at least 580 bc were the transportation systems here you see a, one of these bajos, a tree-covered uh, lowland swamp, which was originally a, a cival. But that line that you see in the middle crossing here is a, a causeway. These are huge, huge causeways. And this is the same causeway. You see the, the civales there and the, the causeway that, that goes through and joining all these cities together in a lattice work. Of, uh, of complex interactions with the other sites. The Maya word for causeway is sac bay, meaning white road. And sure enough, these roads are white. That's a white cement surface that you see there uh, in the excavation. This is all part of the, uh, the, that white, white surface. It's interesting that it's white because um, it'd be difficult to, to carry, you know, 120, 130 pounds on your back in 120 degree heat during the day. But on a white road at night with starlight and moonlight, you could transport this much easier. So we're very suspicious that there may have been a huge nocturnal activity of products and commerce being conducted on the white causeways that, led the, that allowed this uh, activity to take place. And you see the role of these causeways uh, 40 meters wide and two to six meters high, which uh, dwarf all of our causeway systems in Salt Lake, for example. We don't have highways like this. And here's the edge of the causeways. Uh, you see the the causeway there, and then these are the individuals standing on, on the uh, uh, so the width of these things go well, all the way across here, 40 meters wide, uh, makes exceptional construction. And here you see just the causeways that come out of Mirador. Just the causeways from there are incredible um, masses of major constructions that were built there. And as we look at the LIDAR, you can see these, uh, here's, a, here's a LIDAR image of, of the highway, so the elevator, even, even in the, it's elevated in the green down which the lowland swamp, but even as it, as you go up into the highlands, it's still elevated. So it has an incredible, uh, construction effort to build these things. And, and when we look at the first state uh, formation here, you see all the, all the white lines that you see there are, are the causeway systems that link all these cities together. We call it a dendritic system because it's like fingers. They meet, uh, they go to a central point and radiate out like fingers in, in uh, joining all these other cities together and making a unified polity. And we think it's one of the first states in the entire Western Hemisphere, the first political and economic states in the Western Hemisphere because of this extraordinary agricultural capability and allowed them to control the resources to build the largest, some of the largest pyramids in the world in terms of volume. By 300 BC, the surroundings became uniform. This is the only time in all of Maya history when the ceramics were the same from the very tip of the Yucatan Peninsula all the way to Honduras and from Belize all the way to El Salvador. The ceramics are the same form, the same slips, the same shapes, the same uh, tempers, the same paste, the same firing temperature. It's all the same from this period of time. And we believe this because there was a state level impetus a state-level society that was controlling much of the productivity of, of these ceramics and or they were being imitated in other areas of Mesoamerica at the same time. The largest pyramid at Mirador is the pyramid called Danta. Danta is the tapir, and it was named by the Chicleros more than 100 years ago who were out harvesting chicle, and since this was the largest structure they knew, they, uh, they called it Danta. Uh, this is the very summit of the building that you see here. It's been excavated and consolidated with massive, huge stones that are, that are in place on the summit of this building. Here's the LIDAR image of that structure. 
um, that you uh, that you see there. It's massive and it's nearly more than a half mile long uh, and and it's um, uh, three football fields wide and 72 meters high, uh, approximately 8 million cubic meters of 2.8 million cubic meters of fill in the construction. Uh, and you can see the size and shape of the big stones that form the edges of the summit of this building. Now, not only was it massive, but they, they made it very, very expensive. You can see by the, the fellow standing there that these huge stones go lengthwise into the building. So that instead of one stone, they, which they could would take the place of three or four, they had to put three or four stones. So, and there was really no architectural advantage to that other than they could do it. The reason there was no architectural advantage is because the Maya built what we call cells or boxes inside the structure of crude stone walls to contain the weight of the fill of the building. They didn't need to do this. They did it because they could. And there were consequences for that we'll talk about later on. But they, they built it very, very expensively. Well, we've exposed very uh, complex series of pre-classic buildings. This is a pre-classic structure found in the Western Group. We've, we've constructed polycarbonate roofs over the art of these buildings. We've exposed, for the first time, pre-classic stairways and pre-classic art that decorate the facades of buildings. We know what the original colors were. Uh, these were the original colors of this, uh, of, the, of this art and the original colors of the buildings that were there. They were a red hematite that brought in from uh, uh, Baja Vera Paz and transported all the way in there for functional reasons. Their iron oxide ore impeded the growth of, of mushrooms and lichens. Uh, and so it, was a, it had a, an advantage to paint their buildings red like this. They decorated the, the edges of their reservoirs and their pools with, with complex art. This is, a, here you see the pools here, uh, down on this lower image with a dual waterfall that led from one pool to the other. And uh, the art decorated the size of these pools. This is what essentially you see here. You'll see the feathered serpent, which is you see in this image here with the feathers associated with it. You see the great god Itzamna, with the great creator god Itzamna. He's got a beard, got a sunken mouth because he doesn't have any teeth of his, of his age. He's got a snake headdress, but he's got bird wings, a bird torso, and bird feet. Here's another image of him over here. He's got, this time it's an aquatic bird, and he's got a fish that he's uh, uh, apparently feeding. He's feeding the fish as opposed to eating the fish that you see in the classic period. In the classic period, they always show this aquatic bird eating the fish. But in the pre-classic, we know that it was feeding the fish. Some other great uh, metaphor that's being told there that we don't really quite understand. Below, as the serpent curls up, you see the upward peering head of Chak, the rain god, looking up. And he's found in every instance where the serpent goes up. Then below in this lower corner, you see the, the, the feathered serpent or the celestial serpent. You see the celestial dragons. And in the middle, you see two figures that are swimming. Uh, the one figure, these figures are in stucco. Uh, the one figure has his face, a very elaborate headdress, an ear spool. He's got a beard on, curiously enough. His hands in supplicating position. He's, a, he's got a belt on. There's a knot bundle right here on his belt. But he also has a uh, protector because he's a ball player. And then he's got one leg that comes here and another leg that comes down here. But on his rump, is another head, and this head is looking up. You see here, he's looking up. He's got a closed eye. He's got the nose here, and he's got a red, whoops, he's got a red spondylus shell over his mouth. Now, it, it, we didn't understand that because in the classic period, they always place green jade in the mouth of the deceased. But in this case, it was red until we begin to see the excavations in the highland of Chiapas at Chiapa de Corso and discovered they were using red spondylus shells over the mouth of the deceased. And so this is red, we, it's a red spondylus shell over the mouth. This head has been decapitated. 
There is a blood scroll that emanates from the head and comes down in this way. He's got a helmet on right here. And then this, this ball, this round ball here, stands for the number one. And in all Maya languages and all Maya dialects, the word for one is hoon. So our proposal is this is none other than hoon hunapu, who was decapitated in the underworld and rescued by his sons, uh, Hunapu and Ishbalamke. Now, Ishbalam means jaguar, and sure enough, the other figure here has a jaguar headdress, and he, instead of a, a head on his rump, he has a tail. So we think it's none other than the then we have uh, uh, we have um, Ishbalamke, Hunapu, Hun Hunapu, the celestial dragons that you see framing the figures here, the celestial serpent, the feathered serpent, Chuck, Itzamna. You have the entire cosmology of the Maya at 300 BC. The entire story is found there in elaborate fashion and very well carved. We discovered that as we cut the floors associated with these panels, that the art continues down. And in this case, the art shows the titles and names of the polities that are involved here. We'll talk about that in just a minute. You, we've trained uh, with 73 of the finest uh, conservators in the world. We brought in experts from the Gaiety Conservation Institute. We brought them in from the, from the Louvre in Paris. We brought them in from, uh, from the American Museum of Natural History. We brought them from the Denver Museum of Natural History, from the L.A. Cannon Museum of Natural History, from the California Academy of Sciences. And we trained these workmen to deal with how to do this. And so now we have some of the finest conservators that are trained Maya, uh, trained Maya workers that can serve and protect this art. Now, what we've done is we place polycarbonate roofs over this, which light, lets light through, but not UV light. So it doesn't damage the colors. It maintains a constant temperature and a constant humidity, which has a very low uh, variation, which is perfect for stucco preservation. Now, we've exposed facades of buildings. We've exposed huge pre-classic walls. We've exposed the art carved in bedrock. In this example, you have a series of, of, of sophisticated figures in the, um, in the carved in bedrock. But over to the right side there is a series of glyphs that are carved in the glyph. And the bottom glyph down there is this one, as you can see here, which we believe says, Kahul Khan Ahau, Sacred Lord of Khan, or Serpent. And the heads that you see above on the left there are the way it was written 800 years later uh, in, in by the kings of the Khan kingdom that were based in Zibanche and Kalakmul in the northern part of the basin. So we think the original name of Mirador and the actual the entire basin would have been Khan, meaning serpent. Well, all this was vibrant and growing and doing very well until, until about uh, 150 A.D., and this, the entire system collapsed. They left everything. They left whole pots sitting right on the floors of their buildings, pre-classic pottery. They left it right on the floors of their buildings, and they walked away forever. The question is, why? Uh, why did they leave? And then why didn't they come back? Well, you remember that the, um, the, the secret to their success was that rich organic muck, the mud from those, uh, from those civales. When we dig out in the Bajos today, we find that rich organic muck under up to, up to three meters of sterile clay. What would have caused such massive sedimentation to occur? We begin to suspect the use of lime cement. We've noticed through time that floors got continually thicker and thicker and thicker. At 800 BC, the average floor was two to three centimeters thick. By the time of Christ, the average floor was 12 centimeters thick, and in some cases up to 50 centimeters thick of lime cement. Why do you need a floor 50 centimeters thick of lime cement? Well, because of human nature, and we know what our human nature is, it's because they could. They had the wealth, they had the power, and they had the ability to do so, and they did it. So to understand that, I brought um, 
for six years, I sent a team from Berkeley throughout all of Mesoamerica. And we documented how much wood it takes and how much limestone it takes to make how much lime. The results of this are published in these two books that you see down below there. We published these articles in, uh, in, in these books about the use of that. But as, uh, in summary, it takes five to six tons of green wood and five to six tons of limestone to make one ton of lime. Therefore, to cover the to cover the um, the last stucco layer on the Pyramid of Tigre, for example, at El Mirador, required the complete deforestation of nearly 700 acres of every single living green tree. In the the um, when they deforested their forest, then the natural clays washed down into their swamps where they had that rich organic mud and buried it under meters of sterile clay. So you can see there the uh, deforestation is taking place as they're making all of this lime cement uh, in, in these areas. And we find that collapse evident in the pollen samples as well. We find the, in the pollen, we show extraordinary agricultural pollens, and then we find, boom, they quit. The first collapse, and then the second collapse, first collapse at 150 AD, and the second collapse around 900 AD. Uh, two major collapses, and we find dramatic changes in the pollen that show the consistency of those archaeological observations. They were forced to leave then these great and huge and massive ancient cities. The question so much isn't why they left. We know why they left. The question is, why didn't they come back? And the reason is because they couldn't. They couldn't maintain the big populations out there with that rich organic mud under meters of sterile clay. And this is essentially the story that we can tell by the archaeological investigations. Hundreds of years later, there were small groups that came back in and lived among the ruins, building these small little pyramids like this. But they were painting a unique kind of pottery, which we call codex-style pottery. It's only found in the basin. You'll never find a single example of this pottery at Tikal or at Palenque or Copan or Chichen Itza or any of the great classic sites. You'll never find a single example of this pottery. It's only from the Mirador Basin. So these eccentric scribes are living in the ruins of the ancient cities, painting these incredible texts and incredible um, examples of this codex-style pottery. But they were also building buildings with extraordinary deity portraits of stucco. And these were just a few examples from one building that we have 68 examples of these heads the full-sized heads, by the way, that came from this one building by, uh, by Danta Pyramid. Now, to understand the concentration and density of the cities that we knew to be out there, we had to employ a new technology. And we were, we were the pioneers of this technology in Guatemala. Dr. Arlen Chase is the one that first alerted us to this on his work in Caracol, Belize. He started using LIDAR and was able to peer through the jungle and see this, and as these planes fly over, they shoot the, the bands of, of, of lasers down which bounce back to the plane, carrying the exact um, images uh, or the profiles of the terrain that's there. Now, we, we were able to shoot that at 560,000 points per second. And right now we're shooting, uh, we're shooting areas along the very edge of the basin uh, at uh, nearly a million points per second. Uh, of, of this fine resolution. And as, as you fly over the jungle today, this is what it looks like as you fly over it now. But when you fly over it with the LIDAR, it looks like this. This is that jungle that's completely peeled. The trees are peeled off and we have 100% of every single platform, every single causeway, every single wall, every single dam, every single structure that's out there we have 100% knowledge of every single one of these. In fact, we're working on a book right now on the publication of these, of these LIDAR results that will be coming out before December. These are the ancient cities that are found in the basin, and every one of those are much larger than Tikal. So as a result, you can see in, in a 1,000 to 2,000 years earlier 
than sites like Tikal. So as a result, it gives us a whole new window into the native giants of the Kalakmul uh, Basin system. When you compare Tikal, for example, at the same scale in Mirador, you see Temple 1 is, uh, here's Temple 1 of Tikal, and Temple 2 over in here. This is Temple 3 over here, and Temple 4 over in here. And the entire central section of Tikal fits within a tiny section of the west group of Mirador. And Mirador is 132 square kilometers, which makes it essentially larger than uh, than Los Angeles in 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 the density and concentration of major civic structures in 132 square kilometers. Now the problem occurs when we get a, ro a, a road into the system. You get a small community that starts, and what was once pristine tropical forest is cut with a chainsaw and burned to the ground in a matter of weeks. And, and these fires, 100% of these fires are human caused. They, they're burning. In fact, the, the picture on the left is a satellite image at 1.30 p.m. on April 3rd. And you can see the edge of the basin right in here, but the smoke from the fires goes all the way up through Houston into Oklahoma, South Dakota, North Dakota. It goes all the way up into the Midwest of the United States. Every one of those red dots, for example, is a is a cattle pasture. Every single one is a cattle pasture. And the basin that you see outlined in yellow is the last patch of tropical forest left in all of Guatemala and southern Mexico. This is the future of the Paten, unless we change the model somehow. Now, to fight the, 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 in 1996 with the peace accords, the U.S. government, in its brilliance, formed the logging concessions out in here. And so you can see the ancient cities that are concentrated in the logging concession areas. The problem with the logging concessions is that they're punching roads now for the first time into pristine jungle. And these pristine roads, these roads into the jungle are allowing looters and poachers and the narco, the narco tra traficantes, the narco traffickers, the uh, the immigration uh, routes uh, into this area for the first time. So there's 23 of these locations just in the Carmelita concession, logging concessions. And this is what is going on right now in the last pristine tropical forest left in Central America. We think this is counterproductive. In our estimation, the this is, they don't, first of all, they're only benefiting 40 families in the entire system uh, are being developed, and yet they're, they're destroying the last intact tropical rainforest left in this area. Um, in fact, they're building the wood for the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. It comes from the Mirador Basin. Now, then these logging trucks, you can see the different colors of wood, meaning they're not only harvesting one types of trees, they're, de they're harvesting up to 17 different species of trees. And as a result, the, um, the impact on the environment is horrific. It's horrific. And yet they claim this is the model of this is the model of forestry and community concessions, which is all BS. It's all baloney. It doesn't have it. When you fly over the jungle in an airplane, it looks green and pretty. But fly over it with an infrared camera, and you'll see the damage and the devastation that's being wrought by loggers in these areas. And they're creating what we call fragmented forests. And if you want to know what the consequences are of fragmented tropical forests, look it up on the internet. And you'll see that the, essentially this is the death of the jungle in 25 years. They cannot survive fragmented systems like this, and it creates huge problems in the future. These are the, the logging roads they're punching with bulldozers for the first time. And, and, and not only that, but the fires are, are, are very closely associated with the road constructions. So you have the fires that are booming in these areas. The Paten is burning down, and the, the Paten forest dies that nobody's doing anything. Um, and, and of course, the, the culprits behind this are, are organized crime. Now, just last year alone, they captured 37 
jets like this. They land the jets on clandestine airports, except that one on the bottom there. They managed to capture that before it was burned. But they burn these jets. These are 20 to $50 million jets that are burned after they land and unload. And the cargo goes to the north. These jets are found everywhere. And in one, in one airstrip to the west of us, 40 kilometers to the west of Mirador, there are 37 of these jets that are burned on the, air, on the airstrip. 37 20 to $40 million jets that are burned, just the cost of doing business, you see. But this is the obstacle we're facing. We're also facing the looting problem. Every one of those red lines is a looter's trench into Maya architecture where they're ripping into the buildings, they're ripping into platforms, they're tearing them apart, looking for something to sell as a survival tactic. Now, if we can go back into our own examples, the first, the first national park in the world was Yellowstone Park. And the yellow lines that you see on the right are the existing borders of the park. But in, in 1872, when the national park was formed, they had no idea of the, um, the uh, migration routes of, of buffalo, of, uh, of the uh, elk, of the moose migrations, the bear movements and migrations, the trumpeter swans. They had no idea of all these systems. If we had to do Yellowstone again, we would do it with the red lines that you see there because that is the system that gives life to the national park. So the idea then is to protect the system. Your body is a system. But what if we just protect your hand and the rest of it, we're going to burn, beat, and abuse. If the system dies, what happens to the hand, you see? So the hand has to be more than just the national, existing national park. It has to include the system that will allow it to be preserved and protected for decades to come. Now, I'm from Idaho. I was born in this area. And so this, but this is not a national park. We have three types of park systems in the United States. We have national parks, we have national monuments, and we have wilderness areas. And I've watched these areas my whole life. And I'm convinced that to neutralize the organized crime in Central America, we need to declare the area as a wilderness area without roads and without airstrips. The, uh, the organized crime and narc narcotics traffickers need roads and airstrips. So if we can devise a system, which will be the first one in Latin America, of a wilderness area without roads and airstrips, then we have a chance to save it. Now, in 2020, I took 13 of the leading Guatemalan congressmen representing six different political parties to Washington, D.C., and we met with dozens of senators and congressmen to lobby for a donation to the country for the security and conservation of this area. When organized crime found out that this money, $144 million, was for the security and conservation of the Mirador Basin, they began a campaign against us that you cannot believe. Matt, they've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in our in against us that we were imperialists that we were colonialists that we wanted to build a mormon temple on top of dantha pyramid that we wanted the children of the pretend to starve that we wanted to to build a disneyland out there all of this was false but essentially what it convinced the senators to do since it was such a, a conflictive issue they retracted the money and the money went to africa so in a, in a, in a era of pandemic societies without without uh, without the uh, without employment without industry any kind of future they lost 144 million dollars for the security and conservation of the greatest concentration of ancient cities in the world now we do, we give employment every year to up to 400 workers these workers are highly trained we work with some of these guys for up to 40 years we after they work during the day, we teach them how to read and write at night. We brought in high-profile visitors: Prince Albert of Monaco, Mel Gibson, Prince Albert or uh, uh, Alexander von Saxon of Germany, the royal family of Germany. 
We brought in Morgan Freeman, working with Morgan Freeman. We brought in uh, John Paul DeJoria and Mel Gibson. Uh, Mel Gibson's promised support for Mirador. He's been stellar. He's put millions of dollars into this uh, system, as well as into medical uh, help for poor Guatemalans. Um, uh, we're working with the indigenous societies so that they're aware of their legacy, their incredible, incredible legacy that they have, including uh, high, highland groups such as the uh, the Lords of Totonicapan. This gentleman here was one of the leading figures of the Maya that climbed clear to the top of Danta Pyramid and is now one of the strongest voices in the island uh, Maya for the protection and conservation of the basin. We've had ceremony after ceremonies and presentation after presentation to the Maya in, in 14 different villages now, including photo exhibitions in villages in the highlands and in Mexico and in the United States. This is in Los Angeles. We did a, a photo exhibition so that the, the people are aware of their legacy and become aware of that. We're training the community guides so that these people are the people taking uh, the tourists into the sites and explaining accurately the information that, that can be available to them. We're putting uh, uh, inf informative uh, panels in, in the site so that people can see and understand what's going on there. We put 144 computers in the different villages in the, in the villages that surround the basin. So for the first time, these little kids are breaking the cycle of looting and poaching and prostitution and, and drug trafficking. And they're now getting to learn skills on the computers that give them a huge opportunity advantage in this day and age. This is the village of Carmelita, the last frontier town in, before you get into the basin. The people were drinking water from these two holes here. Uh, and we had a huge amount of infant death from from poor water, absolutely terrible water. So with the Rotary Club, we put in the um, we put in huge cisterns. We replaced the roof of um, the church and the school and the community center and channeled water into these huge underground systems, and then filtered it with a very complex filter system. And so the finest water in all of Guatemala is found in Carmelita. Uh, which we have dramatically changed the uh, the health and status of people. We're publishing books, including 31 books of 1,000 to 1,500 pages, each one consisting of official reports for the government. These books are now been published. We're producing a series of comics for the schools, for the children to understand their legacy and understand how they, uh, how they, uh, how they, how they play a role in understanding and being to protect their tremendous legacy. These are books we have programmed to come out shortly um, and, uh, uh, and that will be coming out, giving more information on the flora, the more insects, a volume on the Calm Kingdom, and the Maya book on Maya Genesis is coming. Now, how do we make it accessible? If we hike the Mirador right now, it's two to three days one way to hike in there, or we helicopter. So we spent $50,000 a number of years ago in determining how to get people in there. We examined roads. We examined airstrips and, and hot air balloons. We examined ecological trails and bicycles. And they all have advantages, but they all had huge economic and, and, and environmental disadvantages. For example, the road up here, the roads, Carreteras, it's uh, access like Tikal is greater tourism, but it leaves the communities outside of the, of the economic pattern. It promotes deforestation. It promotes looting and, and uh, poaching of animals. It's extremely expensive, $120 million to put a road in from Flores to Carmelita. It, it has an alter, a permanent uh, alteration of the environmental and hydrological system out there. And it, pr it promotes invaders and especially the narco traffickers would love a road in this area so they can move product to the north. We've examined airstrips, but it leaves the communities outside the loop and it invites the narco traffickers to, to fly in there. We've examined hot air balloons, which are silent, they're interesting, but a huge risk. If we, since the risk, the, the breeze comes from the Caribbean, we would be able to, if we were lucky, to land in Oaxaca, if not all the way to Japan. Uh, make a complex system. 
we've examined this ecological trails, for example, which are a little more advantages, but they, they have, the mules have to eat ramon trees, the leaves from the ramon trees, which means you have to deforest those trees to get the mules to eat. And you have wood ticks and worms and parasites, and you're walking in fecal material on all the, on all the trails. It's not, this is not sustainable. We've examined bicycles, which are quiet and silent, but it only benefits for just a few. And it's six months of the year that are impassable because of the rains. The only thing that we found that had huge advantages and absolutely no disadvantages are miniature train. A miniature train, like you have at Hogo Zoo, for example, or you find in, in some of the, um, the parks, well, actually found in 120 zoos throughout the world because they're quiet. They're silent, they're easy to maintain, they're cheap, and you could bring in people uh, from um, all kinds of areas that carry up to 100 passengers at a time. You don't cut trees down, you go around them, and it makes it so it would be a, 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 an ecological trip without a road. The trick is to get a people in there without the roads, which would be accessible to narco, narco traffickers. This would be kind of a route that you would see, which would allow people to see eight or nine cities like Tikal or larger, and all of them date to a thousand to two thousand years earlier than sites like Tikal. At the same time, we'd fortify the existing concessions, the forestry concessions, but it'd be it would be not logging. We think logging is the kiss of death. We would try to su support a shate, which is a a palm a, a palm that's cut and stays green. You use it florists florists use it all over the world, or chicle for chewing gum or allspice, or the ramon nut, which has a high protein, or bayal, which is a, a vine that makes incredible basketry, or rainforest honey, or copal, or chile. Uh, these, these products can be mined there. And for the first time, you would have eco lodges and eco hotels that would be, allow you to sleep in a nice, comfortable bed, have a nice shower, and have a great meal in some of the most remote locations of the world. We would also have in, in the villages that surround the basin, since there are absolutely no, not one person lives in the borders of the basin, not one as of right now. Uh, but in the villages around it, we would have uh, museums and, and, and visitor centers. We would have, we would try to reconstruct the ancient ball courts so that the villages could play the ancient ball game for tourist uh, observation and participation. There is a solution to this type of rampant and massive deforestation, and that's using these ancient cities as the catalyst for the conservation and preservation of these areas. All right. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope I was able to answer some of the questions that you might have, and I'd be open and free to any questions you might have. Steve, I'll turn the time back over to you. Well, that was fantastic. I, you know, we're leaving in uh, three weeks, and I'd just as soon leave right now. I, I, that is just so cool. I, I loved your pictures and the explanation. Uh, we, we've got a a question that uh, maybe helps illuminate uh, a lot of what you've been talking about, and that is, uh, who's this we that you're talking about? You keep on saying that we've done this and we've done that. Could you elaborate on who we well, the is? The Basin Project is the largest project in the history of Guatemala. We have uh, 40 full-time specialists involved from 64 universities from throughout the world. Um, and um, uh, this includes all types of, of botanists and biologists and geomorphologists and entomologists and and herpetologists and geologists and geomorphologists. All of these people are involved in this program, as well as uh, 30, 32 Guatemalan, outstanding Guatemalan archaeologists. Um, and uh, so that, that's the team that forms this, and they're employed full time. We employ these guys full time. They're working in the laboratory when they're not out on the field. So we employ these people. We, we were uh, processing millions of artifacts that we process, and it all goes to the NASA Museum. So when I say we, I'm collectively referring to the large team that supports and sustains all this project in, in, uh, in, in Guatemala. So is that the FAIRS Foundation? Is that part of what the work is? It is. FAIRS founded the Foundation for Anthropological Research and Environmental Studies, F-A-R-E-S. Uh, okay. I formed this in 1996. 
um, when I was at UCLA, I found that I had a lot of sponsors from Berkeley that did not want to give money to UCLA. That was just, that was just taboo. It's like being from the University of Utah, giving money to BYU or vice versa, you know? So they, I formed the foundation as the neutrality system, which people could donate to the project and still not, uh, still not lose their close associations and friendships in their respective towns. Okay. Foundation. So I, I thought it was fascinating how many, um, you know, celebrities, big names you've gotten involved in this. How do you think that your work as a consultant for popular media projects like Apocalypto or Survivor have influenced public perception of Maya culture and, and the need for preservation and and conservation work down there? You know, when I did Apocalypto, we had a huge response, negative response from the academic community. You see, in their minds, the Maya were peace-loving, uh, gentle folk, looking at stars, reciting poetry, and living in harmony with their environment. So when we showed Apocalypto, which was based on the actual ethno-historic documents and observations of the Spaniards and the archaeological data, the archaeological data is overwhelming that what you see in the Apocalypto is what was going on in 1515 AD. I mean, this is exactly what was going on. So, of course, that brought in a huge uh, dilemma. In fact, it was such a dilemma that in 2007, the American Anthropological Association formed a special presidential session in Washington, D.C. to refute and to rebuttal the film Apocalypto. And of course, they, they had me there, and we were over 2,000 people in attendance at that meeting. And, uh, and of course, we listened to all these arguments about how the Maya were stargazing and poetry citing and in harmony with their jungle. But when I get up there and show the realities, the archaeological realities and the ethnographic and ethnohistoric realities of this, it, sh it shut the entire thing down. I published a paper on that that to date is still the number one, I think there's over nearly 10,000 readers, readers have read this article in a book by Springer Press, um, an article by Springer Press on Apocalypto. If I've got it here, I do have it here. It's, um, it's the film on, um, let me grab it now. For those that are interested, you can get this volume. Just a second. Springer, of course, is one of the leading scientific publications in the world. They produce all types of scientific documents. This is a volume called The Ethics of Anthropology and Amerindian Research. And in this article that I that I published in this volume, it's entitled, it's entitled, um, it's called Relativism, Revisionism, Aboriginalism, and Emic Etic Truth. The case study of Apocalypto, in which I presented all the the scenery from this film that we did. We spent you know nine months filming that film in Catemaco uh, region of my uh, Veracruz, Mexico, and uh, we did all the research on the costumes and the decorations and the activities and the 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 uh, all the stuff that they were doing in extraordinary uh, <laughs> fashion. And uh, then I published this article, and it showed all the evidence that everything in Apocalypto was what was actually going on, including skull pits and the 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 murals from Chichen Itza that show the sacrificial the sacrifices taking place, and the evidence for sacri sacrifices all over Mesoamerica. Not just the Aztecs were doing it, but the embassies of the Aztecs throughout the entire Mesoamerican region had convinced the locals to do it as well. In fact, when Gonzalo Guerrero was, was shipwrecked in 1511, there were, there were six of these uh, sailors that were shipwrecked, and only two survived. The rest were sacrificed and eaten. But the two that survived escaped to a nearby uh, city, Maya City, and there found favor with the king. Uh, Gonzalo Guerrero married the, 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 the princess, the king's daughter, and actually became a Maya. 
and drove the Spanish off the entire eastern coast of Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, that's why Mex that's why Merida is where it is today. They had to come in from Progreso to get to Merida because Gonzalo Guerrero drove the Spanish off the eastern side of the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, incredible story. And Jerónimo de Aguilar heard that Cortez was at Isla Mujeres, and so he went and joined Cortez. But since he spoke Maya, he was the link between Malinche, who was the uh, the the Aztec woman that was sold to the Maya in the Chicalango region of Laguna de Terminos. She spoke Nahuatl, she spoke Maya, so she could speak Maya to Gonzalo Guerrero, who could speak Spanish to Cortez. And that's how the conquest of Mexico was able to take place. If he, mm. if he had died, it would have been virtually impossible for C Cortes to have pulled off the conquest that he did in 1519 in the highlands of Mexico. Yeah, you mentioned earlier how we can't read the pre-classic writing. Right. Uh, it just made me wonder how many different writing systems have been discovered in Mesoamerica? Only two. Well, there's three. There might be an early text type from, from the Olmec region as well. Uh, there's been several, uh, 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 a monument that was found in the river uh, at um, in in Mexico that has a very unusual text, but it's the same, it's carefully incised text. Um, and uh, and there, there's controversial, but nobody can read those texts either. So there's two or three systems that are in, in play there in, in the Maya area. You also have the Zapotec writing in Oaxaca. There's writing in early Oaxaca that we, we have there as well. But the rest of it is not really script. It's more logograms uh, as opposed to a phonetic script. A phonetic script has, a, has a, a value that can be sounded out. And then you look it up in the dictionaries, you can see exactly what they're saying. Um, this is not the case in... Uh, this is not the case of the Maya. They, this is actual phonetic script that they're writing and recording these uh, these uh, uh, historical events on stone and on pottery. Um, and our earliest samples are we have about two to three hundred BC. The earliest writing that we do have is from San Bartolo, which was carbon dated from a painted text at about four hundred BC. So we know that there's still even earlier scripts out there, but it's all it seems to be the same kind of script. Just can't read it. Can't read it yet. Well, we need, let, a let, need a larger corpus. Well, let, let me ask you one last question. This this may be this may be a hard question. I, I but I'd I'd love to hear what you what you have to say. What what would you say is the most exciting or most surprising or unexpected discovery you've made during your work in Guatemala? Well, I've been out there 45 years now. Um, and um, the, honestly, I've, I've, I've excavated royal tombs. I've excavated jade masks. I've excavated incredible monuments. But the most exciting and the most important, I think, in those 45 years was when I discovered uh, the ceramics on the floors of the Jaguar Pa Temple that were pre-classic, when everybody thought they were classic, they, they were classic period buildings. That completely changed the entire history. You see, when I started this with Ray Matheny at BYU in 1978, the pre-classic Maya were hunters and gatherers. Can you imagine if, if somebody would have called Gordon Willie at Harvard and said, some guy named Hansen says there were huge pre-classic cities with seven, 80 meter, 80 meter pyramids uh, and, and sophisticated architecture and art. He would have said, well, that guy is so full of crap. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And they would have hung up and have been lost forever. But these, the idea was that we had extraordinary complexity a thousand years earlier than what we thought possible in the pre-classic periods. And that's that's the advantage of the Mirador Basin. We have the chance to save it now. We won't have that chance five years from now. I don't think, even this year, even this year, in May of this year, we had 150 peasants with machine guns and brand new Glock pistols and tractors try to come in on the northern side of, of the site of Mirador and 
and start making uh, roads and start making, uh, uh, dividing and all, making villages. And the government sent out 500 soldiers and drove them out of that area. And they retreated back into that red, all those red dots. They retreated back into this area, into here. But that, um, that um, uh, the military doesn't dare go in there because they are, the narcos in there are better armed and there's, there's more money there. I mean, they're not laundering millions. They're laundering billions with a B. And they're laundering with cattle. And these guys are are terrifying, and so they, as, as and unfortunately, the use of cocaine in the United States and Canada and Europe has doubled in the last through last four or five years. It has doubled. So as a result, there's much more money to launder. There's much more need to launder. They do it with cattle, so they need more pasture for the cattle to 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 graze in, and uh, and it's uh, it's a real threat. We have a real problem here. And and the only way I can see to neutralize these guys without confronting them, because if you and I confront them, we're dead in two days. We're gone in two days. So the idea is to form the wild, first wilderness area in Latin America without roads and without airstrips, but with that miniature train, which can be easily controlled and be easily monitored and, and, and have the communities actually run and operate those trains we have a chance to save it, and that's the whole well. Thing. You're doing you're doing great work down there. It's so exciting! Like I, I you know, I'm sure all of us would love to talk with you again after we go down there. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance again sometime to uh, to learn more from you. Thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. Uh, we we really appreciate the time you spent with us this evening. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, you too.